we want to share in the word of God. I will read from Acts, uh, from the book of Isaiah, first of all, Isaiah chapter 6, and then I'll be reading from the book of Acts as well. These are short passages, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 8. The title of the message today is Embracing Your Divine Calling. This month is a month of the divine embrace. And uh, for you who is coming for the first time, the word embrace has been marking our summons. So today is embracing your divine calling. Isaiah chapter 6 from verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, it was loud, like Pastor Regan said earlier from Revelation chapter 5. And verse 11 and 12. This was loud. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people, uh, I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, Lord, send me. Now we flip the pages to the New Testament and we get to the book of Acts. And from the book of Acts, chapter 13, I want to read the the first five verses, Acts chapter 13. When Barnabas and Saul had finished, I'm starting from verse 12, the last verse. When Bar Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, and uh, also called Mark. Then verse 1 of chapter 13. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, who had been brought up with the Herod the Tetrarch, and so, while they were worshipping, while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they had arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for this word I have just read. And now in the exposition of the same. I commit myself to you. Lord, I ask that you speak through me and you speak to us today. Father, thank you for your presence and you have been present among your people many years, 2,000 years plus, and we bless you in this new season, new dispensation of grace. And so today I commit us, the congregation to you and even those who are watching online so that this word would indeed be a blessing to all of us. In Jesus' name we've prayed, amen. We may have our seats. Embracing your divine calling. And uh, this is a story. Actually, these are two commissioning services. We have a commissioning service in Isaiah chapter 6. And there is a man called Isaiah who is being commissioned. And we also have a commission, commissioning service in Acts chapter 13 in the New Testament. And we have a man called Saul and his author is Paul, Saul, uh, being commissioned. That was long ago, those two commissioning service. Today we have a commissioning service. God is always looking for a man or a woman he can use. And so today I raise a commissioning altar, a commissioning altar. 
where God sets apart a man or a woman and sends them uh, to do something very, very specific. And I thank God for Saul. I also thank God for, uh, for Isaiah, that in their time, during those commissioning services, they responded appropriately. My prayer is this, that in this commissioning service in the 21st century, here this morning, commissioning service, as you hear the voice of God, you will respond appropriately. God is amazing. I have divided this into three parts. A vision of God, when you look at Isaiah chapter 6, a vision of God, a vision of self, and a vision of the assignment. Three things. Three commissioning things. A vision of God, a vision of self, and a vision of the assignment. The Holy Spirit hovers over a commissioning moment. And the Holy Spirit begins a work within the heart and the mind of a man or a woman. And there are things that begin to happen at a commissioning moment. And in these commissioning services, these people are able to see these things. And I really want to thank God. First of all, a vision of God. A vision of God. A vision of God. Look up. A vision of God. You can never really be commissioned unless you first see God. To be commissioned is to be sent, it's to be set apart, it is to be separated. It is impossible to experience highest levels of separation and uh, consecration unless you truly see God, unless you have a proper visual of God. In Isaiah chapter 6, what does the Bible say from verse 1 to 4? This is Isaiah being commissioned. In the year that King Uzziah died, and this is what the Bible says in verse 1, I, in the first person, not my brother, not my sister, not a group of us, not even Parkland's Baptist Church, he is saying, I saw the Lord. This is commissioning. That statement there, I saw the Lord. And that is why I really encourage retreats, taking a retreat from the city. This place can get very busy, and you are seeing all kinds of things except the Lord. You take a retreat, and you go to a place that is quiet, like Jesus used to do. Mark 1.35, a little while before day, God, Jesus went to a quiet place, and there he interacted. He had fellowship one-on-one -on -one with the Father. That is powerful. You know, he says in the year that King Ozea died, I saw the Lord high and exalted. This is how he sees it. And if, if, when you have a vision of God, this, you will see this. You'll see him above your money. You will see him above your education. You will see him above your fears. You will see God for who he is. I, in the first person, I saw the Lord high, 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 and exalted, seated on the throne. You know, God is king. He is Lord. He cannot take a second position. He is seated on the throne high and lifted up. And the Bible says, the train of his robe filled the temple. The glory of the Lord filled the whole place. When you come to the presence of God, one of the things you see and notice is a glory, Shekinah glory. It is called the glory of God. And in verse 2, above him were seraphim, each with six wings. Now these were angels of fire. And uh, these were mighty creatures. And with six wings, two of them uh, covering, of course, uh, covered the faces, and we took, they covered their feet, and uh, we too, they were actually flying. And listen to this. When you come to God's presence, something is quickened. Because you see God, the attributes of God. And they go on to say, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts, it was such a powerful voice, the foundations were actually shaking, the door frames and posts were shaking, the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. If you are seeing, if something is distracting your life, it's an idol. It begins by saying, in the year King Uzziah died. Well, I guess, and I think probably Isaiah either was a chaplain to the king, and uh, as long as this king lived, there was something distracting his vision. 
because of, of, of whatever he was seeing, King Uzziah, distracting his vision. And he couldn't see God clearly. Today I want to say if there is something distracting your vision of God, it is an idol and in a commissioning service, you push idols aside. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3, Exodus 20 and verse 3, what does God say? And let me say this, our God is a jealous God and he will not share his glory with any other. He says, you shall, let's read this one together. You shall have no other gods before me. Make it first person. Make it for yourself. I shall have no other gods before me. Now, that is a commissioning statement. In the year King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord. For somebody here, it is their money that's in the way of seeing God. For someone else, it's a career. Maybe your children. Maybe your spouse. And these people have occupied a space. And because of that space, you cannot see through. If you really want to be set apart for God, the kindergarten of that is a vision of God. You truly have to see God. And whatever comes in the way of seeing God needs to be moved, needs to be removed. There is nothing that can compare to our God. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25, in verse 26, whom will you compare God to? Isaiah 40, verse 25, and uh, verse 26, if you can get me there. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes. Look to the heavens. Who created all this? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not, not one of them is missing. I want to tell you our God is great. Our God is beautiful. Psalms 27 verse 4. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after. Uh, let's read it together. One thing I ask the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek in his temple. Now, this is sanctifying. My prayer today is that God will give you a true perspective of things. And the only way you can have a pure perspective of things is by seeing God first. By seeing God's, God first. Now, when you see God and his beauty, chains start breaking. If you had become a slave to something, and you felt like if this thing gets out of my way, I am finished. When you see the glory of God, all the chains begin breaking and you are released for God. Because you see him in the fullness of his glory. And when you see the glory of God, when you see the fullness of God, then everything becomes less. And that's why it becomes easy to say yes to God. Because you see him above everything else. You see him as precious. You see him in his attributes. You see him in his goodness. You see him in, in his mercy. You see him in his power. You see him in his love. You see God in his favor. When you see God, a vision of God. And I suggest to us congregation today, if you are to embrace your divine calling, call number one is a call to see God. Now listen. In Matthew 4 and verse 19, when Jesus was calling the disciples, what did he say? Come follow me. It's a call to him. Come follow me. He started with him. Come follow me. The call to come. The call to come and see God's glory. Before he went on to say, come follow me. The second part is, I will make you the call to become. Now the call to come and see the glory of God is the first call. See God. See God. Come means get out of something. Break free from something else. Fix your eyes where they should be. Come and see me. Come follow me. I will make you. I, you will become fishers of men. I will commission you. Come follow me. In the year King Uzziah died, 
Are you here today and uh, you are seeing another glory? I want to tell you, you haven't seen anything yet <laughs> until you see the glory of God. Hallelujah. Until you see the glory of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There is no glory like that. I'm a pastor today. I saw the glory of God. And I, I left where I was. I, I was working. Because, you know, I was there, and I'm not saying work is bad. I was working, but when I saw the fullness of the glory of God, now it was easy for me to say yes. Because I saw who God is. I saw what he has in store for me. I saw his plan for my life, and it was easy to say yes then. It was easy because of the glory of God. Not because it wasn't going to be difficult. It was because I saw him who is the author of the call, and his name is Jesus. So in the year King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord. Idols keep us from seeing God. Is there an idol in your life? How do you spend your time? How do you know an idol? Where do you spend your time? If you look from morning, the whole 24 hours, and you just do a registry of how I spend my time. From the time I wake up, this is how I spend the first hour, the second hour, the third hour, to the 20th. By the way, time is a gift from God. And God wants you to spend your time in his presence. How you spend your time is telling. See the glory of God. If a lot of your time is spent on your work and there is no time for God, then that job is an idol. If a lot of, a lot of your time is spent, uh, you know, traveling, then traveling becomes your idol. What is your idol this morning? Different people have different challenges. But for Isaiah, it was Uzziah. Now I'm asking, what is this Uzziah that has come in your way? In the year King Uzziah died, that means the removal of Uzziah, Isaiah's vision became clear, and Isaiah saw the Lord. A commissioning moment is a moment to see God afresh. It's a, it's a moment to see him uh, once again. It's amazing. When you see God, even worship becomes easy. Giving your money. I mean, when you see the glory of God, uh, it becomes easy to give your resources, to give your time, energy, you know, to give your knowledge. It becomes very easy because you have seen the glory of God. My prayer is this. May God reveal himself to you, then even your circumstances and challenges of life will become less because you are seeing God. Today, as we reflect on the commissioning of the Holy Spirit, let us pray that we shall see God afresh. For those who are being ordained today as deacons, a leader, you can never lead. You will lead. Your leadership is commensurate to your vision. Your leadership is equal to the vision of God. If you don't see God clearly, then you, you will also not lead people to see God clearly. Also in our own families, fathers and mothers, your children cannot rise above your vision and your vision of God. If you haven't seen God clearly, then that next generation will also not see uh, God clearly. And when you say, I'm seeing God clearly, but your children can see there's still an idol in your life, now that is, that is a, that's a lie. And that creates a problem. So I pray for the deacons who are being ordained today. May God grant you a fresh vision of himself. Serving God can be challenging. And you will see all kinds of things. But you have to remove your eyes from those things. You know, some things you see, some things you hear can be very, very challenging. And it's very easy to be distracted. Let me tell you, my friends, even as a servant of God, it is very easy to be distracted. And you start having your eyes somewhere else. A leader must always have their eyes on God. That's what keeps you strong. That's what keeps you, uh, you know, going. And that's what distinguishes you. Keep your eyes on God. And so the year King Uzziah died, Isaiah did what? He saw the Lord. A singer sang a song and he said, Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch him, and say that I love him. 
Open my ears, Lord. I want to, what do we say? Open my ears, Lord. I want to hear you, Jesus. Before the ears open, the eyes have to open. And I want to see Jesus. Somebody else sang another song and he said, my hallelujah belongs to you. Hallelujah. My hallelujah belongs to you. Nowhere else. My, my praise, my worship. In other words, my eyes, my, my fixation. Hallelujah. My praise, my focus, and my vision. These eyes of mine belong to you. You can never serve the Lord unless you start there. Otherwise, so many discouraging things will come around and you get distracted. But number two, a vision of self. In embracing your divine calling, it is important to also look at yourself. In verse seven, 5 to 7, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5 to 7. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The next verse, he says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your, uh, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Not only do we see God, we need to see ourselves. When you come to God in his glory, very quickly the mirror turns on you, and you begin to see yourself in the light of his glory. Not in the light of worldly standards, because worldly standards are short, and they can be very deceptive. Self-righteousness is when you develop a righteousness on the basis of a measure other than God, a measure either given by society or community, or a measure that you have set for yourself. But when you come before the Lord, and you see the divine stature and divine standard, begin to see yourself, you cannot but begin to say, I repent. I realize I am a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You begin to see that you even don't deserve. You see yourself in the light of his glory. Look in. Not just look up. You begin to look in. Now when you look in, there are things you notice, like Isaiah notices. There is unclean lips, there is guilt, and there is sin in his life. In Hebrews 12 and verse 1, the Bible says this. Lay aside every weight and sin which so easily besets you and run this race with perseverance, looking to Jesus, who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. A vision of self. God is the only true judge. Our calling is not to be a judge for everybody else. Our calling is to come to God in his presence and in his presence humble ourselves and see ourselves for who we are. And then become open before God. And as God shows you something here, something there in your life, throw that baggage away. For Isaiah, it was sin. It was guilt. He had unclean lips. And the seraphim had to go and get a very hot coal to come and touch the tongue, his lips, and declare him, you know, forgiven and take away his guilt. Commissioning means aligning yourself to God's standard. Commissioning is, you don't have to be elsewhere, you just need to be where you are, but you align yourself to God's standard. Now that is sanctifying and that is uh, uh, consecrating. Aligning yourself to God's standard. Throw out all the baggage that you don't need and begin to bring in the kingdom, the kingdom blessings inside your life. Are you here like Isaiah and you're feeling, I am not worthy, I am a sinner? I want to say, that the consecrating God and commissioning God is able to cleanse you from all sin and all unrighteousness. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, the Bible says the following. If you say you have no sin, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. Uh, let me begin here. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and he'll forgive us of our sins and purifies us from all unrighteousness. Go back to verse 8. Verse 8. Just one verse. Yes, this one. If you say or claim that you are without sin, you are deceiving yourself, and the truth is not in you. And therefore, a lot of people are not commissioned 
because they have refused to accept God's measure and God's verdict concerning themselves. Now you come to God's glory, but you still want to stand in your own righteousness. And you stay there, you stay there and you say, I have nothing to deal with in my life. So many people have been stuck and they are not yet commissioned because they have not accepted what God is saying. Our God is gracious. Our God is loving. Our God is sanctifying. Isaiah is an ordinary man. He's going to be made ex extraordinary by the glory of God, first of all, but by the sanctifying and the cleansing power of God. God uses ordinary people. All he needs is for someone to come to his glory, set apart all the idols. And secondly, you come to him and you say, I'm not able, and you allow, allow divine resources to begin to work in your life. God to cleanse you, the cleansing resources, restoring resources, equipping resources, and you allow the resources of God to begin to make something out of nothing. And Isaiah, who is an ordinary man, now becoming extraordinary because the molding hand of God, Jeremiah chapter 11, you are clay in my hands. Are you feeling worthless? There is grace enough and God's hand is powerful. Isaiah 59 verse 1 and 2, God's hand is not shortened that he cannot save. God is able to change and clean you up, you know, completely and then dress you with the robe of his righteousness. It doesn't matter your past. Last, uh, last, this week we had the singles conference and we had a very candid, uh, some candid discussions Friday night uh, when I was here and uh, you know, some people even shared very deeply from their lives. And, you know, this lady shares about her past and some of the things uh, she did. But then she found a lady called Rahab in the Bible. Rahab in Jericho. She was a prostitute. And I want to tell you, God is able to give you a new destiny. It doesn't matter your background. And God can commission you to become such a powerful tool for his kingdom. Your history will not stop it. That baggage needs to go. And Rahab in Jericho, she was a prostitute. But she helped hide some spies. And because of hiding spies uh, from Israel, before they took Jericho, she hid the spies. She was rewarded and, and her life was saved. The, to cut the long story short, Jesus Christ comes from the lineage <laughs> of a prostitute. Have I used very strong language? Jesus Christ comes Rahab. From Rahab, you trace it. You will find Jesus Christ. Isaiah comes in a sinner. The tongue, uh, you know, the coal touches his, his tongue. He comes out righteous and not, not in his strength, but by the grace of God. Every person can serve. Every person is called but people don't respond first because they haven't seen God fully for who he is. And therefore, they are holding on to idols. And they are saying, I can't let go of this. I can't let go of this. My brother, my sister, see the glory of God. It will be so easy to let go. And there are those who have not responded because there is something they feel that God cannot deal with from their past, from their history. Maybe it is sin. And God is saying today, if you trust me with your life, I'm calling you, if you trust me, with your life, I'm able to turn you into the extraordinary, I'll make you righteous, and I'll make you worthy. When you left your house, maybe you even insulted the person you left there. The Lord is touching you afresh. Hallelujah. Now, when you leave to go back home, you will go with a new tongue in Jesus' name. And you'll go as a, 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 a commissioned person, a servant of the Lord. And you'll go in there, the same person who left, now sanctified, consecrated, touched by the blood of Jesus, and you go in there, and you're there, and you're saying, my brother, <laughs> I said when I left here, I insulted you, and I said, I hate you. My brother, I love you. Now I embrace you, and the same tongue preaching the gospel, the same tongue preaching salvation, the same tongue proclaiming healing, the same tongue speaking favor, the same tongue, setting people free. That same tongue that was putting people in bondage, cursing them, destroying them. All of a sudden, the Lord changes that around. Embrace God's calling, you know, for your life. And this is the day. So I say second, the second thing is this. Allow God to do a work inside. 
First, I work on your eyes and you develop this vision. Secondly, look in and ask God to come in. Psalms 139 verse 23. The Bible says, search me, O God. Psalms 139 verse 23 and 24. Uh, 23, Psalm 139 verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. But I must finish and go to the last one here. A vision of the assignment. So the first one was look up a vision of God. Look in a vision of self. And now look out a vision of the assignment. In verse 8, Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. The Bible says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, uh, here I am, send me. In the New Testament, in the book of Acts, chapter 13, the one that, uh, the one that I read from verse 1 to 5, the Holy Spirit spoke and he said, verse 2, just go to verse 2. While they were worshiping the, and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. Now, when we dedicate and ordain these deacons, new deacons who are coming, we are not uh, dedicating them to a position. We are dedicating them to service. It is not the office. We are not called to the office. We are called to the ministry. We are called to serve. And that is why if somebody enters spiritual leadership without a vision of the assignment, then they cause a lot of problems, a lot of problems. And it is important to pray and say, God, give me a vision of the territory. Give me a vision of what you want me to do. Neither the church at Antioch was moving from a small ministry to reaching the whole world. It was a small congregation. And the Holy Spirit spoke to this small congregation and said, it is time to do, to do global missions. It is time to take the whole world. And although they didn't have much money, they set apart Saul and Barnabas to take the first missionary journey, and they went in a southwesterly direction all the way to Salami, to Cyprus, to Paphos, uh, you know, they took a boat in the Mediterranean into the island, then another boat into the mainland in a northwesterly direction, and they covered a very long distance, over 2,000 kilometers, actually probably 3,000 kilometers, on boat, on donkey, and these guys, nothing could stop them. God gave them a vision of the work. Now, when you read Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, the Bible says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you to the end of the age. God says, I will fellowship in the great commission. That's why we call it a core mission. It's a core mission. And God is looking for core workers. God is looking for partners. And therefore, when God calls, he calls to an assignment. God does not call to an office. Yes, offices are there. Being pastor, like I have that title, pastor, if I just carried the title and the office, that is nothing. But pastor, there is administration and there is a service. And it comes by vision. It comes by seeing souls. God gives you territory. God shows you Nairobi. And he says, I want to give you Nairobi. And you start praying and you say, as a deacon, even, I mean, any one of us. And you say, God, give me Nairobi or I die. Now that is what God calls us to. Otherwise, if you are called to church on Sunday to do an activity here, an activity there, an activity the other place, now that is not satisfying. And later, it, it, it leads to fights and conflicts. And then you discover there's not enough work. Because, you know, there are only enough <laughs> assignments here. But when, if you take a, a flag like this and you say, Lord, give me Mauritius or I die. Hallelujah. Then the Spirit of God rests on you in a new way. We are called to service. 
But this service comes by a vision. And we pray that God grants you the vision. In John 4, verse 35, Jesus said, You say, yet four months, and then the harvest. Don't you, aren't you saying it is still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes, open your eyes, and look out. Look at the fields, they are ripe for harvest. God is saying the fields are ripe for harvest. Has God given you a talent? Has he given you time? Even time is a gift. Has he given you energy, the strength you have? Has he given resources? Has he given you knowledge? Has, you given, has he given you an advantage, in one, a privilege, or something? Whatever God has given you, he's saying connect it with my vision of the territory and then begin to deploy it for my glory and I will use you powerfully for my glory. Now, a man called Jonah had this commission, but Jonah went the opposite direction. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, I pray today you are not a Jonah who hears the voice of God, and instead of going the direction God is calling, you decide to run the, the other direction. When we are in the place that God doesn't want us to be, we can never know peace. In fact, we cause problems. We cause problems. If you are not in the commissioned place, the place of commissioning, serving the Lord, you find nothing works. And you cause problems for anybody and everybody, even in that company. You just keep causing problems. And Jonah thinks he's wise. God wants you to respond today like Isaiah, not like Jonah. And say, here I am, Lord, send me. Jonah heard the voice of God, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to, free, to flee from the Lord. That is, he was running away from the Lord. Is there somebody here? And you know God has his hand on your life. But instead of going in the direction God wants you to go, you have been going in the opposite direction. God is calling you afresh today. And he's saying, instead of being a Jonah, become an Isaiah, become a, a Saul or Paul, who will say, here I am, Lord, send me. Or become like the disciples of Jesus Christ, as I close in Matthew 4, verse 18 to 22. When Jesus comes calling, Jesus comes calling from verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother called Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for the fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I'll send you out to fish for people. At once, the Bible says, at once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, another set of brothers. He saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them. And immediately again, they left the boat and their father. These ones left their boat and also left their father. And they followed Jesus. Jesus is calling today. You are watching me online, wherever you are. I say Jesus is calling today. I invite you to respond appropriately and say like Isaiah, Here I am, Lord, send me. May, you, may your eyes be open to see the glory of God then you'll find it easy to let go. Any other thing that has become an idol in your life so that you can serve the Lord. May your eyes be open to see yourself having seen God and ask God to take away the weights and sin in your life and cleanse you and clothe you with righteousness. May your eyes be open to see yourself in the, in the kingdom standard. But finally, may you see a vision of the assignment. If I was to give an exam to these deacons who are being ordained, and I ask you, write your vision. What territory has the Lord shown you? What are you coming to take for the kingdom of God? I don't know whether you're able to write it very quickly in about a minute, and I, and I read it for this whole congregation, starting here, and I say, this is what I see. And as I enter, I'm not coming to an office. No, the Lord has shown me what I need to be doing. Hallelujah. Because as we pray and commission, that's what we are praying for. 
and you're here, the Lord is calling and he's saying, I want to use you. We have been saying, Africa, arise, shine, and go. How will it happen? It will happen through people who have humbled themselves and who have responded to the call of God. In this country, there are so many places to be reached. All over Africa, there are so many places to be reached. Today, as I pray, I am asking that you also pray for yourself and you say, God, open my eyes to see your glory. God, open my eyes to see myself. And thirdly, you're saying, God, open my eyes to see what you see, to see the territory, to see the people that need to be reached. God, give me a niche. I want my life to count. I want to make a difference. I don't want to be a Sunday Christian. I want to be at work on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday for the glory of God. And when we gather on Sunday, it shall just be a time of testimony. And we shall all come saying, here is the harvest. And we shall all praise the Lord. Did you know that the level of worship, the strength of worship on a Sunday is dependent on the service during the week? If you have people who have really served the Lord, when they come on Sunday, it's just thanksgiving. It is normally praise. It is worship. Because you know I bring a testimony into the house of the Lord. But if it's only Sundays we encounter God, then it becomes quite a challenge. My prayer today is that I commission, I think we are 3,000, which is a very good number, hallelujah, <laughs> this morning. My prayer in the sanctuary here is that I commission 3,000 missionaries in Jesus' name. Our God is a missionary. Nobody is being left out. Let's give a hand clap to the Lord. Nobody is being left out. 3,000. Plus the ones who are watching online, wherever you are, you can't delay anymore. Don't procrastinate another second. The hour is now because the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are, are few. If you are watching me from the pavilion or any other room space, it's also, this call is also coming to you. So this is a very simple altar call. You don't have to come here. Wherever you are, we're just going to take time and release ourselves to the Lord. Um, I know, Pastor Riggs, there's a song you have told me. I will just do something, you know, very brief, uh, very brief, and then we will, uh, we will be praying. It's commission. The Lord is calling. And so it's not only pastors who are called. It's not only deacons who are called. The call is for every man and every woman. John 15, verse 16. I have chosen you. John 15 and verse 16. I have chosen you. I have ordained you that you may go and bear much fruit. John chapter 15 and verse 16. So this call is for every man and every woman. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? 21st of October 2018, 7 times 3. Today is a very special day. I am sending forth over 3,000 missionaries to go into the city, to go into Africa, and to go to the whole world. We'll do a verse of that song. I surrender. As we are singing, let's stand up. Uh, we sing together. Just once more, but I invite us to lift our hands to God. Let's lift our hands to God. Oh 
want us to pray with our hands lifted up and and we can pray this prayer we could pray and say put it this way together here i am lord use me here i am lord send me today i lay down every other idol today i choose to see you my god high and lifted up and your glory filling the temple today i confess my sin i lay aside every weight and every baggage that has slowed me down i invite the cleansing power of the blood of jesus today i pray give me a vision of the harvest i am commissioned to serve the whole world in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen a hand clap to jesus <laughs> our god is good hallelujah hallelujah let me bless you father in the name of jesus i want to thank you for this wonderful congregation that is positioned in this prophetic city and in a prophetic nation my god i know that you have been moving all over the world looking for a man or a woman you can use and father we thank you that today we have heard your voice now we walk in the blessing of the great commission because you've promised those who obey the great commission their feet will be beautiful and you have also promised in Matthew 28:20 that you will be with them to the end of the age and so i speak the blessing of the presence of god in your life over your life through your life this week wherever you go and i proclaim that god is going with you you need not be afraid of anything god has taken over that vision you have seen may look so big but god is bigger than that vision and god will provide for that vision don't be afraid may you walk in the blessing of those who have vision may you walk in the blessing of hope and the strength that comes from the holy spirit may you this week walk in the blessing of the anointing of power that comes upon a people of the great commission may you walk in the anointing that breaks the yoke of the enemy may you walk in the anointing that speaks and healing takes place that speaks and deliverance happens may you walk in the anointing of the power of the word of god father i thank you for these blessings that i have released because they are not just consumer blessings consumer blessings blessings for just me they are blessings lord that usher somebody to bless another and that's why lord i'm praying the abrahamic blessing and i decree and declare you are a channel of blessing you are not an end user of a blessing a channel of blessing you are blessed to bless may you be blessed like abraham people will call you blessed whoever blesses you is blessed and whoever curses you is cursed you are blessed now like jabez you are bound your territory is expanding god's hand is upon you you are making impact your future is bright so on monday you're blessed on tuesday you're blessed wednesday you're blessed thursday you're blessed friday you're blessed saturday you're blessed and this coming sunday you are blessed because i've released these blessings in the mighty name of our lord and savior jesus christ and god's people say amen, amen. another hand clap to jesus amen. our god is good amen. amen and now surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and i shall dwell in the house of the lord forever and ever and ever amen have a great week